na mihi nui ki a tato kato e rungi te ngō o to tato ariki o ihu karaiti. A very warm welcome to our church service together today. Just like those lambs, we're drinking their milk with great enthusiasm and are becoming stronger every day. Let us all drink from the presence of the Lord, from His Word and from His Holy Spirit. E tō mato matua e te rangi, whakapaianga tō ingoa, our Father in heaven, blessed be your holy name. Let us pray. Eternal God, the one true God who lovingly created this whole beautiful universe, blessed be your name. Thank you for all you have created. Thank you for the life you've given to each one of us. Thank you for reconciliation and fellowship with you. Thank you for eternal resurrection life in your presence. And now we confess ways in which we may have displeased you in this week past. Grant us your forgiveness and your restoration. And now we open our hearts to worship you this morning in spirit and in truth. We're going to read together from Psalm 84, selected verses. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Lord Almighty, my God and my King, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are forever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favour and honour. Lord Almighty, blessed are those who trust in you.
Tēnā koutou e te whānau, ngā mihi nui ki e koutou katoa. Well, here we are again back still in lockdown um, and I'm wondering if you have been doing some exercise. Have you guys been going for walks or maybe some bike rides? Um, because Shelley and I have been and when it's raining we do workouts in the lounge. Uh, they are just 20 or 30 minutes and our favourite workouts on YouTube are by Body Project and one of their workout videos has 33 million views. And I bet that Daniel and Wade and Angie would never have imagined that when they made the video two years ago, before COVID, that it would um, be used so much by people around the world because of lockdowns. And I think the reason that it's so popular is because the video uses real people, ordinary people doing these workouts who sometimes struggle and they pause and they encourage you that anything you do is okay, that you can stop any time, um, whatever level, you're, level you are, um, you're a winner just by making the decision to go on there and to start. And every small act counts um, and it can make a big impact on your health further down the line. Um, so sometimes Shelley and I, we don't feel like doing a workout and we're not very good at it, but we know it's important and we just do it. And that, along with some other things, has inspired me to do my talk this week on the story of Esther in the Bible. Now, Esther was a young girl who was one of the exiled Jews who were taken from their homeland to live in a foreign country. And her mother and father died, so she was an orphan. And she was adopted and raised by her kind cousin Mordecai. Um, in the capital city of Persia. Now Esther and Mordecai were just ordinary imperfect people, just like you or me or Wade or Angie and from Body Project videos, um, but God used them in an extraordinary way. Despite their difficult circumstances, when they courageously made the decision uh, to do something in time of trouble uh, with far reaching good effects for millions of people. The basic story of Esther that you might recall is this in one sentence. Humble Esther wins a beauty contest and uses her position as Queen of Persia to save the Jews from an evil plot against them. So you might know the gist of the story, but I really recommend you read um, the whole story of Esther again so you can discover there's many interesting and carefully arranged patterns woven into the story by the writer. Uh, the book of Esther is a really great story to, to read all in one sitting. And it's interesting that in the entire book of Esther, there is no mention of God. This is done deliberately to show that even when God seems absent, he's actually working behind the scenes. And throughout the book of Esther, God is controlling and directing and working through what seems to be trivial things that happen and coincidences, and using ordinary people in order to rescue his people during a terrible and frightening time of trouble and threat, and to achieve his ultimate purpose, which is redeeming the whole of the cosmos. But what about for today? We might be wondering where God is, and what God is doing to allow um, this COVID pandemic to disrupt our lives and, and the whole world. Um, just like in the book of Esther, God seems to be hidden, but he is still there, active and sovereign, um, even when life doesn't seem to make sense. Um, and, and amidst all the broken systems, imperfect cultures, harsh governments, uh, there's an ultimate purpose that God has um, that we don't understand yet. Back to the story of Esther. The king of Persia, King Xerxes, is not happy with his current wife, Queen Vashti. And out of all the beautiful young women in his kingdom, he selects Esther to be his new queen. And Mordecai tells her to keep it a secret that she is a Jew. Okay. One of the king's officials is called Haman, and the king commands that everyone should bow down to him. But Mordecai refuses to bow down to him. And because of this, Haman gets a bit angry, and he gets the king to make a decree that on a specific day, not just Mordecai, but all of the Jewish people be destroyed, killed, 
and annihilated. And when Mordecai hears about this decree to kill the entire Jewish community, he contacts Esther in the palace and asks her to approach the king and ask him to stop this decree and save the lives of the Jews. But Esther is not too sure about this because nobody was allowed to go and see the king in his throne room without being summoned first. And if they did, they could be killed unless the king raised his golden scepter. So as you can imagine, Esther uh, was fearful to go before the king. In the midst of this tough decision, God uses Mordecai to speak a profound truth to Esther and us. And this is what he says, who knows, perhaps you have come to the world position for such a time as this. And in hindsight, we can see that God has placed Esther in her royal position as queen for this exact moment, for her to go out on behalf of her people and to save the Jews from being annihilated. But at that moment, this is a gut-wrenching decision for her because she's not sure what's going to happen. And she asks Mordecai to get all the Jews in the city to pray and fast for three days and then she will go and approach the king. And I'm happy to say that Esther did have the courage to just do it. Courage is doing what you know is right even when it's hard. And she says, if I die, I die. Then Esther goes before the king and he extends his gold scepter and long story short, from that one small act, all the Jewish people are saved in the end. So you need to read this book to find out all the details and amazing coincidences and ironies in the story. And in the Kids Time email today um, is a link to a really cool Superbook Kids video of the story of Esther. So for us today, we could take the words of Mordecai and apply them to our own life. Who knows, perhaps you have been placed in your circumstance, in your family, in your community, in your church for such a time as this. COVID pandemic or whatever it is. So when we look back on this lockdown or COVID season, will we only see all the bad things and the doom and the gloom, the outrage and the criticisms and the bitterness? Or will we look at it through a different lens and see many silver linings. God working in people's lives, um, being able to serve one another and help each other through tough times, uh, looking for ways to love our neighbor. What did Jesus say were the two greatest commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. There are no greater commandments than these. So when Esther stepped up and went in front of the king and spoke to save the Jewish people, she couldn't have known that one small act of loving others could make an impact on so many. What small act can you do and I do that can have an impact on many people? Well, about now is a good time, I think, to launch Operation Christmas Child again in our church. And Julie Lang has asked me to promote this to you all. And here is a video telling you all about it. The children are completely overjoyed. It's a real celebration. So many smiles on their faces. Smiles are all over. Yeah, these kids behind me are so excited because they've just received their boxes. Kids are so excited. Giving them a gift, do it in Jesus' name. And that's what this is all about. Operation Christmas Child is about expressing the love of God. It's its wonderful way to enter into the Christmas spirit in its true meaning. Operation Christmas Child has grown hugely over 30 years since it started here in Britain but now it is a worldwide project to send millions of shoeboxes all over the world. That's what I love about Operation Christmas Child. It knows no borders, it knows no boundaries. It's all about sharing the name of Jesus Christ. 
So the shoebox journey essentially starts from people in their home packing shoeboxes full of essential items like a toothbrush, some school supplies, toys and gifts, hygiene items, so there's a real mix. I love choosing the things to go in a shoebox. I like to think about what a child would enjoy receiving. Father, we commit these boxes to you as they start their journey. It's so encouraging having people coming into the church, bringing their boxes. All sorts of people can help with Operation Christmas Child. It's families, it's churches, it's hundreds of thousands of volunteers that help make Operation Christmas Child so successful. The volunteers lovingly check and prepare shoe boxes for international shipping. Everybody out there who packs shoe boxes, they are spreading God's love. Some of them go by train, some go by camels, some go by ships. These boxes go all over the world. And that is only the beginning. So when the children have got their boxes, they are invited to take part in something called The Greatest Journey. Which is a 12-lesson discipleship program where they learn about the greatest gift, which is Jesus Christ. After a child completes The Greatest Journey, they graduate and receive a certificate and a Bible in their own language. When the light of the gospel is turned on, it makes everything new. Operation Christmas Child opens doors for people to discover what is the greatest gift of all, the love of God through Jesus. It is impacting children. It is impacting families. It is impacting the world greatly. I really encourage you to pack a shoebox and get involved with Operation Christmas Child. Lives are being changed all over the world. It's brilliant. So because we are in New Zealand, our boxes will go to children who live in remote Pacific Islands, such as Fiji and the Solomon Islands. And this year, there is an activity sheet that you can include in your box if you'd like to, um, that your kids can fill in, and there's the opportunity that they can make friends uh, with the person that receives the box and they could write to each other. Uh, or you can just uh, write a letter or include a photo if you want to, uh, along with your gifts. In kids' time, uh, we put together a box for a boy and a box for a girl, and we include a photo of kids' time. Um, so how can you get your box? Well, um, once we're at level three, there will be the option of a contactless pickup of a box from the church. And uh, in the meantime, you can start collecting gifts for the child. Um, so for more information for Messy Prezi people, we can contact Julie Lang, or the church office to get Julie Lang's details. Um, and for Riverhead, um, you can contact David or Mavis because there are some boxes that Riverhead would like to fill as well. Um, and the boxes will need to be returned to the church by October the 17th. So thank you very much. God bless you all. Ka kite anō. Do let us know if there are any particular needs uh, prayer needs or otherwise that crop up during the week. Well, the Zoom Cafe, again, is after the service today, uh, just time of fellowship for half an hour or so. Uh, the link is in the newsletter, it's in the email, and it's in the YouTube comments. Uh, and here's a short clip about life during lockdown, and this one's from uh, one of our families, from Ian and Rachel uh, Headley-Wakefield. Do enjoy. Good morning. We trust you're having a blessed day today. And if you're watching this in Auckland, then like us, here in week five of lockdown. It feels a little bit like Samwise Gamgee in Lord of the Rings where he says, if I take one more step, I'll be further than home than I've ever been. And each day level four now is the longest we've been in lockdown. And to be honest, it's really lame. One thing that most of us have done during these lockdowns is to do a whole load of baking, whether that be fresh bread, cakes, or muffins. 
We've done a few types of bread, a couple of cakes, and most recently muffins. Despite how lame lockdown can be at times, God has been good to us in the everyday things. Eli turned five the first day of lockdown. It was his second birthday in lockdown, hence the cake baking. Both Eli and Caleb have been making the best of it, playing together, spending their days digging in the dirt and finding bugs. Oh, he's so cute. And when the weather packs in, they're building lots of Lego. And most recently, they've taken a liking to building animals out of Lego. It's a snail. And I made it out of Lego. Definitely you and me by me. Auckland has an abundance of beautiful green places to visit, and the weather has been great most of the time. We've thoroughly enjoyed visiting a few of the local parks and the beautiful bushwalks. Why are you going away? One of the things I'm thankful for is that God took the time to create the coffee plant. And I know he really loves us because he didn't put coffee in the book of Leviticus and outlaw it. Let us pray. Lord, we pray for others. We pray uh, for our country. We pray that the uh, efforts to curb the current COVID outbreak may be successful and we pray in particular for those in the front line and in essential services including quite a number of people from our own church watch over them we pray we pray for those who at this time are grieving for those who are sick or in hospital and for those who are just struggling with life at this time we pray for our MPs as they consider contentious issues, that they may have wisdom and discernment from you, that they may listen well and make wise decisions. We pray that they might protect the rights of everyone in our country. We pray for the young father in Timaru who has lost his family in such appalling circumstances. And we also bring before you that family that's missing in Marokopa. And may your grace be in the mix of that worrying situation. We pray for the spiritual state of our country. We pray that there may yet be a great spiritual resurgence of faith in you, uh, especially uh, bringing many people from younger generations to a newfound faith in you. We pray that you might strengthen your church across the country. And we pray for our whole troubled world, that your people might be shining lights in many dark places, and that those who do good may be strengthened, and that those who want to work evil and make people suffer may be restrained. These things we pray in your name. Amen. Good morning, Massey Riverhead. So as I was reflecting on recent events in the world this week, and I was prayerfully considering what to preach, the theme that stood out to me was the one of sin. Now, I admit that is not the most cheerful topic, but I think it might prove strangely relevant. But first, let us pray. Lord God, I thank you for today, and I pray that you would bless the words that I speak and that anything that is of me would fall away and anything that is of you would resonate in the hearts of those hear hearing this today. In your name we pray. Amen. Right. So, what is sin? Well, in its most basic form, the Greek word for sin is hamartia. And the word hamartia is actually an archery term meaning missing the mark. And so sin at its most basic level is missing the mark. Not me mark, but the, the bullseye mark, right? It's not hitting the ideal bullseye that God has set up for us. So that's sin at its most basic level. But let's get a little deeper. 
So there's this theologian named Cornelius Plantinga, and he has some interesting insights into what exactly sin is. And Plantinga defines sin like this. It is the disruption of created harmony and then resistance to the divine restoration of that harmony. Again, it's the disruption of created harmony and then resistance to the divine restoration of that harmony. And thus, God hates sin not just because it violates his law, but more significantly because it violates shalom. And shalom is being the Hebrew word for peace. So God hates sin because it breaks the peace, the shalom, because it interferes with the way things are supposed to be. And that is why God has laws against a good deal of sin, because God is for shalom, for peace, and therefore against sin. In fact, one might say that evil is anything that breaks shalom, whether physically, for example, by disease, or morally, or spiritually, or otherwise. But sin in particular is moral or spiritual evil done by persons. Sin is evil that only persons can do. Sin is any evil where persons are to blame. In short, then, sin is culpable, shalom-breaking. Sin is something that disrupts something good and harmonious. It's like an intruder entering a house uninvited. And like an intruder, sin is something that deserves reproach, rebuke, and punishment. And so to sum up, sin is one form of evil, an evil committed by persons. And that evil, in turn, is the disruption or disturbance of what God has designed. Shalom is God's design for creation and redemption. Sin is blamable human damage of these great realities, and therefore an affront to their architect and builder, God. So, you might be asking, how can I tell what sin is? And well, I always tell people to start with their own moral code. Do you live up to it? You know, put Christianity and the Bible aside for a moment. Do you even live by your own moral code? Do you ever break your own personal shalom? Ask yourself, have I fulfilled every New Year's resolution I set in my life absolutely perfectly, right? I would imagine that anyone who is honest will admit that even by their own standards, they have sinned. But what about Christians? How can Christians tell what sin is? Well, like I said, you first start with your own moral code. But then as you grow in the Christian faith, as you wrestle with the scriptures, God shows you more ways of living your life in the shalom of God. It is a process. No Christian is perfect from day one. You know, Rome wasn't built in a day. And so, as you grow in the Christian faith, you will start to feel a conviction on certain areas of your life. This is important, right? Because as a pastor, I can only tell you what I believe the scriptures say. It's the Spirit who will convince you. It's the Spirit who will convict you. And so while the Scriptures can say this or that is sin, ultimately, it's the Spirit who will let you know what breaks shalom for you. And and that is an important point. See, because sin can be anything that breaks shalom for you. That means that even good things can be sinful for certain people. I mean, having a job is good, it's great. But if you spend all your time at your job and ignore your family, you have now broken shalom in your family and therefore have sinned. If you have a history of being an alcoholic, then having even communion wine, for the churches that do communion wine, could be sin for you because it would break the shalom you experience from being free from alcohol. Meanwhile, Someone who has no problem with alcohol could partake in the same communion wine, sin and guilt-free. So here's another question. What does sin do to me or to us? See, sin makes it hard to see God clearly. Often we think, oh, was that one little sin really that bad? Really, was it that bad? 
But, but sin is often very much like rain on a windshield, right? If one raindrop falls on your windshield, does it really hamper your vision? No. Five raindrops? No. Ten raindrops? No. But 1,000 raindrops? Well, then you become virtually blind without windshield wipers, right? So as sin builds in our lives, it, ob it obstructs our view and relationship with God and with others. And sin affects Christians and non-Christians alike. Sin also ultimately destroys you. Back in Canada, I used to work in an inner city ministry that focused on the homeless and less well-off people who lived in my hometown, Edmonton. And this was a common conversation that I had with people while I was working in that ministry. So someone, Frank, you ever do drugs? Me? Uh, nope. Frank, well, don't start. And I remember having this conversation with one guy in particular, and we'll call him Bob. And Bob blew off his face trying to commit suicide while under the influence of drugs. And because of the drugs, he missed and thus survived. And I don't know if any of you have ever seen someone whose face has been blown off and then repaired, but you don't forget it. And I already had enough reasons not to try doing drugs, but Bob's testimony gave me one more. And on a side note, thankfully, Bob had embraced the gospel of Jesus Christ and been helping teach Alpha an intro to Christianity course in the inner city of Edmonton, which is where I met him at this uh, Alpha course. Now, of course, from a Christian perspective, we're all addicts to self-destructive behaviors. Some of us choose drugs. Others choose extramarital relations. Others choose greed. Very popular here in the West or violence, or narcissism, or a combination thereof. Whatever our chosen addiction, it is still self-destructive, and it is still sin. I mean, sometimes we see the destruction on the outside, like my friend Bob, but more often the destruction is on the inside, in our souls. And the challenge is to unmask the horrors of our behaviors before they become too entrenched, ingrained, and habituated. You know, I often compare the human desire for sin to the desire of some dogs for eating feces and vomit. And yes, some dogs eat feces and vomit. It is as gross as it sounds. And I'm not alone in that comparison. The Bible makes the same point in Proverbs 26, 11, and even in the New Testament in 2 Peter 2, 22. And I remember as a child being utterly fascinated by my dad's friend's dog. Because whenever we went over to his house, I would watch an absolute fascination as he would eat his own feces, then vomit it up, and then eat it again, right? And then repeat the process over and over and over again. I just would watch this. It probably has affected me in negative ways. But the point is, it, it, this is what this dog was doing. And sin, also known as our own self-destructive behavior, often looks attractive to our distorted perspective. And to this dog, his own feces was attractive. And the challenge is to help ourselves and others to see that sin is as objectively disgusting as feces. We love our sin because we think it looks like ice cream. Meanwhile, an objective outsider would look at us in disgust as we continue to eat what to them looked like horse dung. And remember, God is the ultimate objective outsider. And so the road to sanctification, to holiness, to wholeness, to shalom, is the road that illuminates the dung-like quality of our various self-destructive sinful addictions. The way we bring shalom back to our lives is by seeing what sin really is. Which brings me to the final question I want to ask. What do we learn about sin through Jesus? Do we... I'll remember the story from a few weeks ago where a man went into a countdown and attacked several people with a knife. Or how about the man behind the Christchurch massacre? These people did incredibly evil things in daylight for all sorts of people to see. 
And I just want to ask the question, what do you feel when you hear about the men who did these things? I'll be honest with you. The first thought across my mind is anger. The first thought across my mind is, is they need to be punished for all the pain they have caused. But whenever things like a few weeks ago or like in Christchurch happen, I have to catch myself from following that line of thinking to its ultimate conclusion. Because what we should see when we hear of those men or any person like them, what we should think about when we see a person like that is we should see the Apostle Paul, called Saul at the time, standing with his garments in his hands. With garments, not his garments, with garments in his hands. Garments that he was holding for his fellow persecutors, who out of tradition and blind ignorance had just brutally murdered by stoning a Christian man named Stephen. And that story can be found in Acts chapter 7. And stoning is about as bad as a way to die as anything. It's more of a community method of execution because no one can necessarily say who threw the exact stone that caused death. That's why the community does stoning. But it's bloody. And I don't know if you've ever seen it. I mean, you can find videos of it if you want. But they actually dig a pit and put you in it up to your waist. And that way you can't really move as they do it. It's bloody, and it's horrible. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, not yet the Apostle Paul, but Paul had just witnessed that. And I would imagine that there probably wasn't a day that went by the rest of his life that he did not think about that. He certainly spoke about it in his epistles. He talked about being a persecutor of the church, the least in the kingdom of God. And Paul probably thought about the day that he was eventually going to meet Stephen in the new heavens, in the new earth. And what was that encounter going to be like? And thankfully, it will be in a glorified state, in one of perfect unity and love. But when you hear about those men, when we hear about those men who did those horrible things, as Christians, we do not have the luxury to hate. You know that song, um, How Deep the Father's Love for Us? It's a beautiful song. And at one point, it's, uh, it's talking about the cross. And it talks about, it has this line, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. And what that line is saying is that I would have been one of those standing there. I would have been one of those holding the garments or maybe even throwing the stones. The reality is, is that we prove ourselves to be very self-righteous and to not really understand the extent of the grace that had to be extended to us by Jesus to save us when we look down on those men. Because, but if it weren't for the grace of God, we likewise would be capable of such atrocity. Now, you might be going and, and, and hearing this and saying, no, 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 I, I, I would, can never do that. I can never do that. But no, I... You don't know your own heart. Yes, you could have. We all could have. I mean, think about how privileged we all are. Many of us didn't choose to be born to parents or ancestors who were smart enough to move to New Zealand for a better life. Or, in this, and this would apply to everyone, we didn't choose for there to be a New Zealand to begin with. Right? Many of us didn't choose to be given the opportunity to have an education. We didn't choose to live in the 21st century instead of the 1st century. We didn't choose not to be born in a context where we were influenced by some radical ideology. If you haven't destroyed your life by sin yet, it's purely because 
of grace. Because of the grace we have experienced, you know, we look back to times like the Holocaust or slavery, and, and we often think we would have been the enlightened heroes of the day, hiding Jews in our basement or helping slaves escape on the underground railroad. But when it comes to, at least for myself, I doubt it. If I didn't have the same amount of immense grace in my life back then, during those situations, like I do now in the current situations I live in, who knows what I would have done. If you are a Christian, you are saved by grace, pure and simple. And that is the truth the Apostle Paul understood immensely, and it's all over his writings in the Bible. That is why, when you hear about those men who did those horrible things, as Christians, we do not have the luxury to hate. Yes, when it, when it comes to those men, there, there needs to be laws, you know, there needs to be order. What they did was horrific. But so is what the Apostle Paul did. And yet by grace, Paul became instrumental in the spreading of the gospel. And I would suggest that we must pray for those men as we should pray for all people. I encourage all of us to recognize the depth of our sin and the awesome grace and healing that is given through the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. If we don't recognize the depth of our own sin, it becomes incredibly easy to become self-righteous, excluding and looking down on others while raising ourselves up and thus breaking the shalom God calls us to. The gospel of Jesus Christ gives us a radical new identity, freeing us from self-righteousness. This liberates us to love people we once excluded and to break the bondage of things, even good things, that once drove us. The gospel puts us into a new community of people, which gives a partial but real foretaste of the healing of the world that God will accomplish when Jesus returns. The gospel brings us shalom, peace, and freedom from the evil which is sin. And so in closing, I want to share this quote because I find it particularly powerful. What we do is important but it is infinitely less important than what Jesus has done for us. And I say amen to that. God bless. I wish you an excellent week. Blessings to all of you in the Massey Riverhead family and to anyone else who may be hearing this now. How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond no measure That He should give His only Son To make a wretch His treasure How great the pain of fearing loss The Father turns His face away The wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to Amen.
had held him there until it was a Dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. Kia tau kia tato kato te atafai. Oto tato ariki a ihukaraiti. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, me te aroa o te atua, and the love of God, me te fifinga tahitanga ki te wairua tapu, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all, now and forevermore. Ake, ake, ake. Amine.